<clears throat> hey there, this is the, uh, uh, Joe Harris speaking. So I uh, decided to go live again. I know it's Friday evening, Friday night. So let me uh, turn this off for a bit. Uh, yeah, you can always subscribe to my newsletter at www.jmk.info. And I have a whole series of topics to discuss. If you want to comment and uh, join in. Like I said, I hope my fan isn't... Uh, causing too much noise I hope you can all understand me I'll just have to turn it around a little bit <laughs> I don't I hope the fan isn't blowing into the I don't have an air conditioning system here in this apartment so uh, I suppose I'll just slowly get started on the topics that I care about all right <laughs> it's fine okay the fans fine all right uh, Right. So, okay, the Trump Biden debate. Somebody asked me to comment on it, but I didn't even I didn't even watch it. I, I saw some fragments and I saw a little bit of it. It's like they didn't even have an audience anyway. Like, <clears throat> I thought I was a bit odd, <clears throat> but of course, they probably knew that Biden was going to be such a catastrophe that they decided not to. Uh, not to even include an audience, even though he waved at the audience when he walked on stage onto the stage, right? He goes like, "Hey!" And then he pointed at his desk like that way, like as if as though he would forget where to go, right? It's two old people, senile men. Maybe Trump is all right mentally still, but clearly Biden is senile. Two old men insulting each other to a global audience, really, because everybody's watching what the U.S. is going to do next, like the formerly most powerful nation in the world, the USA, the former superpower. What are they going to do next? Now, the whole nation is decrepit. It has this very negative vibe of uh, where are your better leaders? Are they all being suppressed by the media? And so on. <clears throat> That's a bit, uh, a bit absurd. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, it does. Huh? It shows the, uh, the decline of the U.S. hegemon. Uh, the United States clearly is not uh, a cultural leader anymore. Financially, it still is. It's because that's because the rich people in the world tend to still live in the USA. And don't say it's all white people because it's overrepresented. More than half of the U.S. billionaires are, uh, you know, Zionists. You know them, and there's quite a lot of Indian billionaires who've moved there, of course, or others who have, like Chinese billionaires who have residency there as well for all sorts of tax reasons, whatever. Right. So it's completely, uh, it's just a billionaire experiment, and you see that. That's odd. These people have, they have the most money of anyone in the world and they are least interested. It seems that they are very little, very little, very little interested in, uh, uh, in maintaining their own front yard, so to speak, their front facing. It's just crazy. You know, Biden is demented and they haven't swapped him out for Kamala Harris, the vice president yet, because she's a total disaster. You know, and then we're stuck with, you know, uh, nothing, <laughs> no leadership. That got me thinking, what if this is planned? You know, uh, this televised decline, this made for TV collapse of the U S economy. It is sending a signal, right? That the age of the old white man is over. Now let brown women take over or something like that, but it's fake. You know, if you would let competent white men lead the USA, you would have something completely different. You would be back in some kind of ancient Greece or Sparta. You would you would have the vibe of things beginning again, right? But it's not allowed for some reason. And I find that odd about our reality. The reality that we live in seems so scripted, like it's one giant stage play and everybody's supposed to just go along with it, even though no one knows what it is. No one knows what the script really is all about. It's, a, it's quite strange, you know? Right, Jewish hegemony. Yeah, right, so... Someone told me, I don't know who it was, maybe it was Daniel Natel. I, I mentioned him often. So I learned a lot from him. And it was this other guy, a Dutch guy who lives in Costa Rica, Mace Bayan, Meowis Bayan. Complicated name, I'll type it in for you. You might find him somewhere. So this guy, uh, he, uh, he wrote a book called The Predators and the People. I spoke about this in another episode, but... That it's all about um, about 500 years ago, our modern time started. And uh, you have to imagine bankers in southern Italy 
Genova, Genoese, and, and whatever. What, what's another uh, famous town in Italy uh, apart from Rome? Florence. I suppose it's like Florence and Genova, Genoa, whatever. These kinds of places where bankers discovered that they could lend money and create the idea of mobile capital. So they could then invest in all sorts of things that they wanted to to happen because that's what you can do if you control the printing presses you get to invest in whatever you want anything you want can can become possible because the money will motivate people to work for it so they can get food right so by moving capital around say you have your production system in Italy but then you have surplus capital you move that to Spain what happens you create something like a Spanish kingdom so the Jews and their bankers initially invested in the Spanish kingdom, the one that defeated uh, the Muslims after the Reconquista. So that empire, the Spanish empire, then becomes most powerful. But eventually it, be it turns against the Jews, the very Jews who invested in its, in its creation, because the Spanish are Catholics at this point, and they start driving out. It, they're, they're called Maranos. A Marano is a Jew pretending to be a Catholic. So lots of Jews pretend to be Catholics by day, and later also others. And so... Spain uh, drives out the Jews, and these Jews, Portuguese and Spanish Jews, they come to Belgium, to Antwerp, and then Flushing, the Netherlands, and then they turn the Netherlands into their next experiment. The Netherlands, around, I, I suppose, around mid 18th century or so, 17th century, somewhat, around the time of the great Dutch explorations, right? When the Dutch people think that they're exploring the world, but they're being invested in by them again by the small hat club by the banker club so you get the dutch empire with the west india company and so on becomes incredibly powerful starts doing trade all over the world and for like 50, for 50 years or so the dutch owned the majority of the about 20,000 ocean worthy ships sailing around the world until the dutch have to well the dutch system just doesn't work out for them somehow and they switch to england and then you have the great british empire taking over everything including the USA, including parts of India, including at some point they control like 70% of the habitable world, right? Of the landmass, the British Empire. And then, of course, they move everything over to the USA because they believe that the US is protected by the silent ocean and the Atlantic Ocean on both sides. They can be isolated. They can be extremely powerful and no one will be able to get at them, right? And so that's where we are now. And now the next step is... They're going to move the U.S. assets over to China or something. Or they're moving east to, or maybe they're going to do that Eurasianism thing that Dugan always talks about. And what they're really doing is they're slowly, gradually working up to their world government with the World Health Organization and the World Bank, right? And there's another one I forgot, uh, all right? And so that's what they do. And the United Nations, of course, it's all to build their world government so that they can own the whole planet and reduce humanity to their cattle. Right? So, so that's uh, that's quite extreme, right? All right, I'm going to pop out my comment section for a moment. All right, turn this off. So we are now actually possibly in that phase where the U.S. US dollar will, may wane, and they're switching over to the east, probably China, a China-led dominated world and here's where i think no 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 there's a bit of a problem because the western nobody looks up to the chinese the western people don't look up to the chinese culturally speaking we don't look up to their music and their culture and like their traditional music and so how are they going to do it how are they going to try to capture our attention and our imagination basically uh how are they going to want us to be more like a chinese spider-man or something or a chinese hulk Right? How are, we going, how are they going to get us interested in their culture? Possibly it might not work out. Possibly it was simply a lucky condition that the European white people have such a cultural appeal that everybody in India wants to be like us and everybody in Africa wants to be like us and every, every Chinese person wants to be like us. It was a lucky condition, perhaps not entirely based on just capital alone. It was based also on the appeal that our culture, European people happen to have. Coincidentally, so if you're going to move everything over to the east now, it may simply fall apart. I, I for one, know that half of the Europeans, the white Europeans, are not going to follow anybody else because the white Americans are mostly of German descent anyway, of Germanic descent majority, and lots of Anglo as well, of course, right? The culture is Anglo, but the, the stock is more than half of them are Germanic. 
And so that's my point. The, the reason why us Europeans, I live in Europe, right? So the reason why us West Europeans and North Europeans, why we care so much about American culture is because it's basically our people. It's just, it is our people and it is an extension, a new version of our own culture anyway, right? Uh, and so you move that over to Asia, you're going to get an Asian James Bond, an Asian Spider-Man, an Asian literature and it might not it might not appeal i suspect it won't and so what you could could witness here is that the globalists are going to shoot themselves in the foot they failed they want to deliberately break down the usa hoping that we can move the u.s capital over to china i mean the money and the and so on move it over to china while at the same time there's they're sending in hordes of migrants to the usa because i suspect that that maybe they want the us to be flooded with guys from india and pakistan because the usa is going to become china's sweatshop china is going to offload its own needs for labor to the usa because they're flooding the us with labor so that china can stay homogeneously han chinese well how about that right so i think it's totally possible that uh the U.S. Is, is deliberately being killed off. It's just being slaughtered like a pig on purpose, right? Yeah, feel free to comment. If I can't comment on your comments, then I'll... Better luck next time, yeah. Right, once they control the currency, they will try to force it into slavery. Yeah, well, they want to do that globally, right? They, can want, they want to do a, a global currency or something universal basic income whichever way they're going to plan to do that but that's how they want to cut us off right and so this got me to the next topic i have a, I have a list of topics here uh, so is perhaps china behind a lot of the systematic humiliations of the west partly due to this possibility that western elites the globalists the billionaires them the bankers are in bed with china anyway because after we started moving uh, Western industry to China, outsourcing it and offshoring it, right? The Western billionaires' money base or their, their financial power doesn't come from the U.S. anymore. It comes from China already. So are they in bed with the Chinese? Are they actually now supporting the Chinese to, uh, to fight the West? Because what would they be afraid of? Oh, hi, I just started at 9 p.m. here at local time, so I've been talking only for 13 minutes now. I usually fill up an hour, so you have at least 45 minutes of me to go here. Let me see here. Someone says, the middle class think highly of foreign cultures on superficial grounds, such as they have nice food. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Or like, oh, uh, Bali is cheap. Let's go to Bali, right? Uh, right? They like it because in uh, Asia, our money is still worth a lot of money. Uh, uh, sorry, a lot of value. Uh, and so, yeah, that's why we like all that. Yeah, they like it for the culture and the music and the experience. And they were so nice to us. Yeah, they're nice to you because you have money. All right. When you don't, when you no longer have the money, they are not going to be nice to you anymore. Yeah, but a lot of people, don't, the normies are a weird, weird species almost, man. It's a separate species. They're so strange. Like they live a scripted life thinking that's what they're supposed to be doing. And they get really, really angry when, you, when someone else does not follow the script. And at the same time, they will completely abandon the script whenever it suits them, right? <laughs> uh, what were my grandfather's occupations? Uh, they were both farmers. But my father's father was a big farmer. He employed 40 people, whereas my mother's father was just self-employed. Uh, we call it Grootboer and Kleinboer, or big, big farmer and small farmer. Like, like the Kulak class in Russia that was exterminated, they were successful farmers who employed some people. Yeah. Uh, so is China behind such systemic humiliations of the West? Because I asked the question, if they're going to move the financial capital base from the West, from USA to China, you're going to have something of a revolt on your hands, right? Like the white men are going to revolt. And isn't that the reason why they're cracking down on gun ownership in the USA? They don't want you to have the means to revolt. Isn't that why they're pushing the LGBT? They don't want you to be strong. Isn't that why they tell you not to eat meat? They don't want you to have muscle. Isn't that why they tell you not to go to the gym? They don't want you to actually grow muscle, right? They don't want you to be manly anymore. They are trying to effeminize you 
to the point where you will not be able to revolt against your government anymore. And you see how calculated this is. Us ordinary, ordinary citizens, like the normie people also, they would never suspect that their own governments, multiple governments, are working together against their own best people's best interests. And that this is how it actually is, is unfathomable to most people, but it's how it's true, you know? Right, they'll, they'll bow down as long as they get their 10 euro curries, right? <laughs> right, do the Dems and the Republicans wish for a cold war with China? Well, you know, the war could be entirely fake. Like, you can use a war to kill off your men, obviously, and to um, basically liquidate your old military equipment. That's what Europe did in Ukraine. In eastern Ukraine, the war has been going on for two years now, right? Half a million to a million dead on total on both sides total. Uh, and what Europe did was we had these stockpiles of ammunition, dunked them in war, but they were old. It was old equipment, old tanks and old whatever, old rockets were shipped there and destroyed, right? And oftentimes the Russians seemed to target these massive uh, ammunition stores in Ukraine, blowing everything up, like they never had any intention to use these things anyways. It's almost as if they're telling the Russians where to get, where to hit, right? I mean... At this point today, Germany has enough ammunition to defend itself for two days. It's a total joke. They, they are not able to defend themselves anymore. All right? Why are, we like to think that this, oh, this is by accident or this is just how it is. But actually, I know that you know, growing up in the Netherlands, I, I remember from the 1990s onward, the 2000s and so on, our politicians were constantly defunding the, the army. They were constantly... Uh, defunding defense expenditures to the point where a career in the military became pointless. It, it was a dead end. It is a dead end. And now all of a sudden they have to go and fight, fight Russia. But we have no equipment. All our equipment was old. So this is how they do it, right? They, the new equipment will be produced by China. And we in Europe will, simply won't stand a chance. You know? And my point here is that the Western globalists, in my view, are in bed with the Chinese already. And they just, they just haven't told us, and they're not going to tell us. And that's why I thought that the debate between Trump and Biden, which was so silly, so stupid to watch, two really old men insulting each other back and forth, like they're dissing each other in a rap battle. This is so below our culture, so far below our civilization. You know, this is not how we do it. And here we are. They're, they're making a mockery of old white men, clearly. That's the symbolism of the, of the debate. And, and they're just going to, you know... To use that as an argument to bring in Kamala or something, or to bring in some, let black people rule the USA. And again, like I said, that's not going to work out because there's no more ba universal appeal. You know, a black snow white just isn't it. The, it. the appeal is gone. And then I think what I think will happen is that the European type people are going to like literally in one day going to switch from one channel to the next channel. We're going to watch another show, you know. All right. The USA is crumbling our infrastructure, yeah. Failing roads, bridges, yeah, of course. And then who has to step in? Exactly, the, the World Bank, right? The World Bank has to give you loans to build up your infrastructure. And who owns the World Bank at this point? China. And you'll become China's bitch. All right. <laughs> right. Yeah, I'm trying to be your leader. But at first, I have absolutely zero power now. It's not like I'm hungry for power. I am hungry for trying to figure out the right story to tell people, the right narrative to give to people, something that sticks, something that motivates us, something almost religiously inspiring so that we feel a new fire in our hearts and souls and minds, you know, to, to go and do those things that we didn't even know you could do and then succeed and succeed in a way that it secures our survival in the long term. Yeah, that's probably what I really want. Yeah. Is it worth moving to Europe as, a, as a, an American European? Well, your, the salaries here are very low, so relatively. Uh, you are probably still better off, financially speaking, than the USA. In the end, though, I do think white Americans may need to return to Europe because we're going to have to... Um, I'm going to talk about that during this live as well. We're going to have to like think of building enclaves, like defensible enclaves. Like you have the Orania experiment in South Africa. 
But there's many other things we can do. I, you can imagine uh, building, not necessarily the cities, but it's the land. You want the countryside to grow food, right? Uh, and water. And so you want to capture certain parts of Europe and defend those and basically turn them into entirely new small nation states uh, run by a, a new kind of aristocracy that is completely separate from the globalists. And the way to fight the way to fight the globalists, I think, is it has to be religious because you have to be able to operate independently from the global money system, the money economy. If you can live and survive and thrive without access to the money economy, you figure out a way to do that, perhaps by basing your economy on labor. You might be able to pull it off. This is why you know, central banks are so terrified of countries that switch to gold. There are, there are only very few countries in the world today that don't have a central bank, you know? Why would we fight globalization? Well, I suppose you like to be a slave and just don't. But the rest of us who want to be free, we're going to fight globalization. Yeah. South Africa is trash now. Yeah, well, I, was, I was mentioning Orania as an experiment, an example that we can copy or replicate here in Europe, of course. Um, I'm not interested in saving Paris or London or Amsterdam. I'm interested in saving some of the countryside where we can have cattle, milk, meat. And if we cannot even have it here, perhaps we can go further north to the subarctic regions of this planet, right? So I have a question for you, like, it feels to me sometimes that we are living in a scripted reality. It's like a big, a big giant stage play. What do you think? Is it like that? Because it seems that people are just going along with programs and plans. But who are really the authors of this plan? And to some degree, I think there are no writers and directors here. It, it is emergent, but also because people are so submissive. Normal people are very submissive people. They just go along with things. They never even think of uh, fighting back or pushing back, right? the way water flows, water doesn't flow up stream, right? Water flows downstream, down, uh, right. Yeah, there are no more leaders in the West, but that's by design as well. They don't want us to have leaders anymore. A simulacra, as Baudrillard said. Yeah, perhaps it is something like it. Yeah, I'm not saying it's a computer simulation. It's more like there's this emergent stage play. Everybody plays along. And if people would just stop for a moment and say, hey, wait a minute, what am I doing? I don't want to do this. Then it would be over, but people don't do it, you know. Like, I feel that the planned decline of the Western civilization is also dependent on this sheepish nature of the masses of the normie people, right? Uh, this brings me briefly to, um, you know, I think Martin Heidegger was the most influential philosopher ever. And Martin Heidegger, the German philosopher from Meskirch in the southwest near the Black Forest of, uh, of Germany, uh, he was an academic philosopher, so his academic work is very hard to read, very difficult to read. But if you distill the ideas from it, Heidegger mentions, he refers to this, that most people have forgotten how to live. And that's true, we've forgotten how to live. Most people just, they go outside thinking like, what would someone else be doing in my shoes? What would one do? What would one do on a Friday night? Well, you're watching the podcast. But normally people would say like, well, one goes to the cinema, one goes to a museum or one goes shopping or whatever. And these are all like archetypes, like for your daily routine, like negative archetypes where you simply surrender to something like, well, you know, on Sunday morning one goes to church or on Sunday evening one meets family or whatever. And people don't really make these decisions consciously anymore. They simply go along with the herd, right? Yeah, the masses are always sheep. It's only a few individuals uh, who will change this. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't read Evola as much. I, I, I read some of Julius Evola, yeah. I have a look at it again, yeah. It's the cult-like monopoly of power protected by a feared police state, yeah, perhaps. Right, you only need about 10% of people to join to have a real revolution, yeah. Uh, probably less, yeah. 
it's a big private club and you're not invited exactly that's how it is oh you wrote me today didn't you cody yeah you asked me about my podcast yeah so i'll put this on my youtube channel at the great johannes i'll type it in here because my youtube channel got monetized so i'm going to put all my videos i'm going to also start posting my uh tiktok videos there as shorts so i'll generate some more uh, more traffic there Yeah, would you like to be in a big pan-Germanic empire? Yeah, like Northwest Europeans. Yeah, of course we could do something like that, you know. Yeah, yeah, I do have a sub stack. It's at uh, here, jmk.info. I post a lot of stuff there, including some essays as well, yeah. So I had an idea. One of the reasons I think why people are so sheepish today is because they've had it so well for so long, for 70, 80, 90 years, since 1945, roughly speaking. And what if people were a bit more confronted with the possibility of death? So this is the difference between carpe diem, pluck the day or pick the day, and memento mori, remember that one day you'll die. Rem memento mori is remember, remember, remind yourselves of death. And by thinking of death a little more often, not to the point that it makes you depressed, but to simply accept, okay, I am going to die someday. It might be today or tomorrow even. It might be unexpected. It might be, right? And by keeping that in mind a little bit, you become perhaps more conscious of your actions and you start to make more decisive uh, decisions, right? Rather than being a sheep floating around, you know, you can make the analogy with being a, would you like to be a paper bag floating on the wind or would you like to be uh, a predatory animal who knows exactly what he's going to do, right? You want to be a bit more like that. You want to be a bit more decisive, right? And accept that perhaps uh, your life could be over soon. Then why not do the right thing today, now, right? You think the bourgeois don't live with fear, like an unconcerned for anything outside the immediate material. Perhaps that's what it is. They're so focused on the material, they have nothing else to think about, right? It's right. Maybe that's a good, that's a good point, actually, that this focus on luxury items, your car, your new phone, and so on, the focus on those material things distracts you from having to think about the mortality of life or the meaning of life. That's probably what it really is. Yeah, very clever. I'm only as wise as my audience is, you know, I, I pick up a lot of stuff that you people tell me. So uh, it's a feedback here. I give back what I get. You know? <laughs> we Europeans need to unite worldwide and form new governments and national defense institutions. Yeah, exactly. So we can have a tribal system with new religious inspiration. Uh, and the whole point of globalism, I think, is we need to be decentralized. In order to fight globalism, we decentralize so that they cannot capture all of us, you know. Uh, I think Nietzsche is very clever, yeah. Nietzsche was like uh, sort of Prometheus, the firebringer who, uh, uh, who gave us a lot of deep insights. With Nietzsche, though, I feel that he's both a little bit of left-wing and a little bit of right-wing, depending on what he's writing about, but still definitely has influenced everyone. It has influenced uh, Martin Heidegger and Carl Jung. Carl Jung studied Zarathustra by Nietzsche for many years. Carl Jung, the Swiss psychoanalyst, who also was so influential. So yeah, it all ties together, right? right. Uh, Europe, should Europe invade Africa? So Europe doesn't need to do that because basically the European Western multinationals, they're buying Africa right now. They're buying the markets. So how it works is this. Say you have Coca-Cola USA, they're buying the bottling companies in Africa. Say you have Heineken, the Dutch beer company, they're buying the breweries in Ethiopia. And so they're just, buy, they're just buying Africa at this point. It's, it's ludicrous. But so you see that there is a new wave of uh, Western colonialism in Africa that no one notices. It's because the Western multinationals are just buying the African companies now. They're buying the market. So that's a bit, uh, it's not something I support necessarily because it has a downside. Uh, it means that the consumer base of the West is switching to Africa. It also perhaps 
offers us Europeans an opportunity then to escape from globalism. If the, if the Western multinationals are now more interested in buying the African markets, then maybe we Europeans, if we are going to be left behind, it may hurt a little bit at first, but it may be good in the end because we will become less dependent on the material side of things. We will be freer in a way to pursue our own interests again, to be to have our own tribes again and our own to become more intensely religious again and focus less on the material and more on the spiritual which we will probably have to do anyway if, if we're going to get cut out of the of the money markets and so on and off, out of globalism if our if we are no longer relevant as a as a market for starbucks then we'll just make our own coffee or we'll make our own something else that would be very inspiring and healthy for us if we manage this the right way, if we actually allow ourselves to live separately from this multinational economy. Yeah. yeah, we need to get back to God and keep God at the center of our nations. Yeah, I think that's very, very right. Yeah. So what are your thoughts on imperialism and expansionism? Yeah. For Europe, I would not be interested in maintaining other peoples anymore. The, the days of the white man's burden are over. We're not going to babysit the world anymore. We're going to want to say to these people, look, we took care of you. All right, goodbye. And now we're going to live our own life again to pursue our own interests, you know. I think black Africans are at risk of starvation because... They, you don't know this or you deny this, but actually Africa imports two-thirds of its food supply from outside the continent. The question is, what are you going to do? It's because the tropical climate of Africa is very bad for agriculture. You know, Europe is uh, perfect for agriculture in that sense. Yeah. All right. Um, so in the West, we see everything collapsing, right? Including like the, the social contract that we used to have between the older generations and the newer generations. The older generations were supposed to pass on what they had to the younger generations so that the younger people would have it as well or better than the previous generations. And it's completely destroyed. This contract is gone. And I think the old people, the boomers, are having trouble processing this, that they had it all. They had the two cars, the three cars, the two houses, right? They had it all. <clears throat> and they had it by age 30. <clears throat> and the new generations are unable to have these things and they're postponing families and so on because they can't afford homes. Also because, you know, so they want to mix people. They want to mix Europe with Africa, but then there's a problem that, you know, the, the wealth disparity doesn't make them very attractive. So. Right. Right, they want to blame average white people for the colonialism of the basically Jews, yeah. I mean, try to explain to an African that Portuguese Jews were the ones who bought the first black slaves in West Africa. Portuguese Jews did that, but they blame Europeans, right? They blame white people, right? I'm going to watch that. Yeah, Bowden's speech on Heidegger. I'm definitely going to watch that. I'll make a little note of it. Bowden's speech. Heidegger. I think Napoleon was a puppet, really. Like so many of these leaders, quote unquote, they were puppets controlled by central bankers. You know, I feel like they're destroying Germany financially now. Like, of all, in every Western nation, housing is uh, going up, right? Housing prices are going up, except in Germany, it crashed by 7%. <clears throat> so I think they're, what they're doing, what that means is they're uh, pulling out of Germany. They're trying to t destroy Germany, financially speaking, again, you know. Yeah, the boomers, they believe that uh, younger generations should just work harder, right? I think Napoleon was a, a, a puppet working for central bankers. Yeah. Right, so here's, here's an interesting perspective. So imagine the millennials, Generation Z, Gen Alpha, who are not going to have houses. They're going to be worse off than their parents. 
and uh, compare them to say the migrants coming into the USA who do you think is going to be most motivated to fight for the scraps I think it's going to be like is it going to be the generation that had it all but is losing it or the ones who had never had anything and they still have something to gain so I wonder I wonder who's going to fight I think uh, imagine this right a war or a civil war between migrants in the West and Gen Z and Gen Alpha who lost everything both of them have basically a fair claim to wanting to have a better life uh, but I wonder who's going to be most motivated to do the fighting and who's going to be most competent most funded to do the fighting right? yeah the boomers took the most but gave the least right 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 no conservatism among the zoomers okay yeah they want everybody to rent have you also noticed that in the past you would buy a house and your cost of your monthly cost would be very low now the monthly cost of, a, of owning a home can be like seven hundred dollars thousand dollars it's starting to look more like rent anyway like what's the point of buying a house if you have to pay thousands of dollars in monthly in taxes property taxes that's just stupid we can't do it we housing is a big deal you have to have a sort of a form of housing that doesn't require you to pay much rent if you buy one or if you build one right what's the point of building your own house like a tiny house and then having to pay a thousand dollars a month in in property taxes that's not why you would do that that's not why you're going off the grid this is nonsense really you're doing that as a pilot project okay All right, all right. Uh, I'll be speaking for another 25 minutes or so to see if I can come up with some things. So can we escape the big cities then and escape this need for conformity? Everybody's just trying to be a good citizen by following the law, but the law is evil. The law is designed in such a way that it's harming you, especially in Western countries where the native peoples and the white peoples are clearly being set back in favor of migrants because the multinationals like i said they're switching their consumer base from europeans to africans right and so they don't want us anymore which can also be a good thing as i explained it gives us an opportunity to cut loose from globalism but then <clears throat> can we also perhaps you know if we're going to build new enclaves in europe can we also perhaps find new land i spoke about this already uh the idea of occupying or colonizing the subarctic like going further north and living off of pastoralism like milk and meat because i saw a little video of uh just a handful of africans in ireland talking about they wanted to colonize ireland and uh take the land and then win power that way and then i shook my head because wait a minute owning land does not give you power the ability to develop land gives you power and if you can't develop land then what are you doing same with resources so many africans think that resources are supposed to make them rich no look at look at how it works nigeria has a lot of lithium for the batteries and they're selling this for like a few cents a kilo selling it to the chinese but the chinese turn that lithium into batteries for electric cars and they sell those cars for twenty thirty thousand dollars each so it's it's in the labor that you need the labor the inventions the intelligence that's where the money is made in the marketing basically right and not so much just the raw resources in your soil aren't usually worth that much and the same is with land if you just own the land but you don't know how to farm it look at what look at what happened to zimbabwe where the blacks took the land from the whites they drove the whites out killing a lot of them and then what happened Zimbabwe starved <laughs> they had to beg the white farmers to come back because the blacks didn't know how to do the farming they didn't know didn't know how to do the large-scale farming with the machines right and so that's how it is you know what's the point of blacks stealing land in Ireland if you don't know what to do with it you know you, you don't get power from land you get power from knowing what to do with land developing it and if you can't do that in Africa you're not going to do it in Ireland 
you know. So I think that's a bit weird. I think those groups of Africans who think like that and talk like that about colonizing Ireland, for example, they're funded obviously by George Soros. They're not. This is not something they're doing. I mean, it's 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 a bit sad, really. They have they are fed really big ideas that they cannot possibly materialize or manifest. All right. So I was imagining something else. Uh, so in the Netherlands, our political capital is in The Hague, right? And the EU capital is just a fair, bit further south in Brussels. It's like uh, one and a half hour by train or so, maybe two hours by train, I don't know exactly, between The Hague and Brussels. And between that territory, you have uh, some Catholic people, where I'm from the south of the Netherlands, which was Catholic. Flanders, north of Belgium, is also Catholic, right? And so you have this potential of a what I call a Catholic caliphate that might be funded, founded uh, between The Hague and Brussels, the two power centers, right? And the idea was that to become a sort of wedge in between the power base of, of the globalists there. Uh, it, you know, you, could, you can imagine doing this in more places in Europe, hard Spartan religious enclaves where you gather your people, you defend it to the max, basically built on top of Plato's Republic. The blueprint in Plato's The Republic uh, serves then as a way to you know, organize your nation with a warrior caste, a priestly caste, nobility and so on, right? And I think that's pretty good. Uh, I have this kind of, yeah, I imagine that these things are possible if we have the right leadership. So I'm gonna try whatever I can. I have several ideas for big projects I would like to be involved in, you know, uh, maybe as a leader or so, right? Uh, basically, what is a leader anyway? A leader is someone who, who just speaks to the people, conveys them new ideas and gets these people motivated to work on them. I mean, yeah, I, I want to do that. Well, well, let's see how this goes on, right? Yeah, lots of countries are going through what Ireland is. But I think they're deliberately destroying Ireland to turn Ireland into sort of black South Africa. Well, South Africa is black, but you know, my, you get my point, right? South Africa was founded by black people. Now they want to send black people to Ireland to make that a sort of black nation, which is really awful anyway, because if you, if you look up the history of the Irish famine, it was actually caused because the, the Irish used to grow wheat or grain or something, and they sold it to the English. And then the British Empire discovered there were farmers living in, uh, in India who also grew wheat or grain, right? And they simply switched suppliers. So they simply told the Irish uh, wheat farmers, we don't need your uh, product anymore. We'll, we're getting it cheaper from the Indians. Uh, and that's when they just decided to starve off the Irish people, drove them off their land, right? And, then, uh, and now, they wanted to they, now they want to replace you with Nigerians who think they're real Irish people. It's just so weird. Yeah, they want to get rid of the Irish, yeah. You know. Now, Europe, Europe can stand alone. We have actually the, the most fertile agri agricultural land in the world, so we really don't need that much. We could survive on our own easily, you know. This idea that we need the world is only in terms of Rolexes and, and Porsche cars, but we can do without those things. No, Africa does not have the most fertile land. Africa is largely tropical, and you can't do agriculture in the tropics. It's too hot, and you have too many uh, diseases. Not just malaria, but you have all sorts of aggressive plant diseases. That's why you're not doing agriculture in Africa. That's why most of the agriculture is actually done in the temperate climates of, say, Europe and southern Canada and northern USA and so on. That's where most agriculture is done. Africa is not fertile. It has too many diseases. So I want to introduce you to a concept of, like, we tend to believe that the world works as follows. The Big Bang sets everything in motion, and then, then there's this long, long road to progress and to utopian infinity, and we'll, we'll all have, we'll all be rich one day. 
But there's another possibility here is that it's completely the opposite. Imagine a sort of spiritual rise where we achieve uh, a high status, high quality of life, and from then it just starts to decline and decline and decline and decline. They make a joke about this, right? So we say it used to be better in the 1980s, and then in, the, in 1980s said they said it was better in the 50s, and in the 50s they said it was better in the 20s, and then they said it was better in the 19th century, and it was better in the 18th century. But what if it was? What if what, they're, what those people are expressing is not that they're all silly, but the fact that perhaps they are expressing that life is gradually declining despite our apparent material growth. So we have more material stuff, but our inner life, our spiritual life, the life that matters, the life of meaning, has in fact been in decline all this time, right? And so what do you do about that? When you get to a point where life has become so miserable and so meaningless, so worthless, that it's not worth living anymore, people are becoming depressed, they are thinking of suicide, right? What do you do about it? Well, what you do about it is basically conversion back up. So you lift your, your whole people or you lift a part of your people back up to a higher quality of life. And then, of course, it begins to decline again. So that's a totally different concept, the concept of uh, brief bursts of quality and then long declines. I would say that Western civilization peaked in the late 19th century, in Europe at least, in the 1870s, 1880s or so, 1890s, that was the peak of European civilization. After that, it's been only in decline, right? Everything got worse. Worse in, in, in terms of social, in, in, me, in terms of meaning and so on, right? <clears throat> oh, is that Evola's idea of involution? Yeah, I suppose that is true, though. Yeah. I suppose that's what it is. What's Africa going to win, you know? If Africa wins Europe, Europe will be worse than it was. So you, how is that winning? <laughs> You know, we made Africa better, but you can't do the same to us. You can't make Europe better. Yeah. yeah, for more prosperity, we have to go back in time. Yeah, more. we want more, as you always say, yeah, we want more time and space, more freedom. Africa does want to take over Europe. The whole globalist system wants you to do that, so we're going to prepare for that, yeah. Oh, yeah, there's a province in Sweden named Falmark, and you can't find anyone there with that kind of last name. But you see a lot of Mohammeds. Wow, okay. That's disturbing. That's really disturbing. This has to stop, man. We're going to have to, you know, take back our lands, bring our people together again. And again, I, I spoke about this earlier in the live stream. People are too... Uh, complacent. They simply go along with the flow, do what they think they're expected to do. Nobody's really prepared for the fact that, you know, you're, what are you? You're not water. We're not just meandering down the hill. We're actually supposed to decide what we want and then achieve that. We have to live a more deliberate life. So stop being complacent, yeah? What book would I recommend for today's youth? Okay, for youths, well... I don't know if I should make a distinction for youths or anybody, but uh, yeah, it depends. I can't really say. I would read the first. I read some books by Ernst Jünger, like Storm of Steel or The Forest Passage. I would try those definitely. What do you think of the German Kaiserreich? Yeah, I, I do speak German. I can understand German very well. So that's probably better than what you have now. If they're going to destroy Germany financially now, uh, yeah, you have this uh, Reichsbürger movement, right? Where they basically say that uh, the present political system is illegitimate and they want to get rid of it. And last December, a bunch of old boomers got arrested for the fact that they were planning a, a, a coup, a <laughs> Yeah, some of them had some handguns, apparently. Yeah, I think 
that is the way to go. We should actually start thinking of it in terms like that, of bringing back, bringing back the native European aristocracies, perhaps not as nations, but, but definitely as people, so that we know, we, okay, we have a real leadership now again, and the people serving this leadership. Men among the ruins, yeah, the clergy flying, yeah. It's all true, yeah. So Central Africans didn't have any ships because also Central Africa hardly has any rivers, so you couldn't really use them anyway. You didn't have any, basically you transported everything on top of your head on foot. Right, there are mercenaries disguised as government agents that look similar that would stop a rebellion, yeah. Uh, it doesn't, you know, a lot of these Africans, they talk about things, has no bearing, no connection to the reality that we all observe. It's just so weird. All right. So I have, uh, I want to introduce to you my own uh, conspiracy theory. I read a lot of books by Martin Heidegger and I read a lot of books by Ernst Jünger. And I got the impression that a lot of Martin Heidegger's philosophy is in Ernst Jünger's books. So the books by Ernst Jünger are meant for the popular audience. So I thought, what if Heidegger, this is my conspiracy theory, what if Martin Heidegger actually wrote most of Ernst Jünger's books? Or, yeah, you know, or some, some way or form. I think uh, that's because you find anything that Martin Heidegger believed, you find it in Ernst Jünger's books as well, you know. Uh, I didn't read their conversations, no. But I think that may be part of the part of the scam is that they're trying to fool you into thinking that they were talking to each other and so on. But I think most of what's most of what's in Ernst Jünger's books is basically Heidegger's philosophy, but written in a in a popularized way so that the masses can understand it. So that's why I recommend these books, you know. Yeah, definitely. Heider, of course, read everything. He read Spengler as well. Yeah, because Spengler's his book, The Decline of the West, contains a whole segment about the question of what is history. And then he asks, like, what is time? What is space? What is movement? And those questions are questions that Heidegger picks up as well. Right, man and technics as well. Right, right, right. Uh, or let me look up a book that I liked about uh, by Spengler. It's let's see. Uh, so the book by Spengler that I liked a lot was Prussianism and Socialism. Right, so Poison Tomb on Socialism. You can have a look at that as well. I think I am mostly, nowadays I would say I'm mostly influenced by the ideas of Martin Heidegger. It just simply resonates best with me. It's like I can work with this, right? But now what do I do next? I want to put some things in pra into practice, right? You want to change this world in some way or form. Like, I think the world is such a strange, weird place but it's largely because, as I said, people are just going along with uh, the program, never questioning anything. And then when new people, new leaders want to stand up, they don't have the authority or not in the eyes of the masses. So should you put a lot of effort into winning that kind of political authority to be their leader? But then again, do you really want to be the leader of a bunch of morons? You don't want to do that either, really. So you really have to think about, okay, what do I really want to achieve and what do I need for it, right?
while communism was always meant to be international socialism, so, we, so that's globalism, basically. That's what we have in the West now, is what you have in the USA, largely. A national socialism, meaning national, if you take the word national, know that natio means birth, shared birth. You have a group of people of shared birth who take care of themselves, right? Now, that's national socialism that I can support, yeah. Being in time, I think, is very difficult to read. Yeah, very academic. It would, you'd be better off reading some... Uh, you, Heidegger also did some speeches. You can find them somewhere on, on YouTube as well. Um, they're in German, of course, but I thought those were a lot better where he makes much more sense about what he's trying to convey. What we need is to hijack people's sense of what is normal and basically, basically dictate to them the new normal that we design for them, right? But it also, this new normal needs to be rooted in something spiritual because if it's purely material as the World Economic Forum tried to do, that doesn't work, right? They tried to change your behavior with the, with the face masks and so on. That doesn't work. All right. Do I watch dissident TikTok channels? Yeah, I watch, I watch. I follow a lot of people, some really smart women who are very uh, insightful here. Yeah. There's this German woman living in the USA, and she's very uh, outspoken. She speaks with a thick German accent. Uh, I think it's like cat in the USA, something like that, uh, with a K, right? Cat with a K in the USA. Uh, but she, uh, yeah, she unravels the German psyche. It says like Germans are just brainwashed, totally brainwashed at this point. Yeah, that's very interesting to hear. I don't know, man. Should we try like be disguised as a moderate movement and slowly and carefully radicalize over time? Yeah, I suppose you could do that. But you know, then you just look the same as all the others. How are you going to win power that way? You're just another of the same, you know. Uh, I haven't heard of Zoomer Historian yet, but I'll check it out. Regular Solaris. Yeah, thanks for the tips, Marlon. I'm going to check those out. All right. I, uh, I've been speaking for almost an hour now, and I, ran, I went through all my notes that I wanted to talk about, so... Uh, you can go to my Substack, of course. I have a newsletter at jmk.info. And you can uh, find more links there. I have a link in .bio slash johannesmk as well. You can check that out to find all my links. I have a Discord, for example. I'm on Telegram. Uh, my TikTok channels, of course. Uh, I'm a, and I'm going to put this this video on, uh, on my YouTube channel at uh, the Great Johannes. Uh, I'll send it out as a newsletter as well so you can have a look uh, usually I run out of talking points after an hour or so so I'll see you next time uh, I'll announce it on my TikTok again when I do another live and then, uh, so thanks for watching and uh, see you another time <laughs>